good morning. Merry Christmas to you. Uh, if I could ask the elders to come up and that are here today, join me up here in the front. We have the privilege today of receiving new members and also uh, baptizing one of our children. Um, the, uh, you're noticing your bulletin that it says that Abby and Luke Murphy uh, were going to come in and be baptized today, but uh, they could make it this t today. So Abby and Luke are off the off the calendar until next month. Um, but we are going to uh, receive Robert and Myrna Aragon. Got, there we go. Great. Come on up. Good to see you guys. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. Good morning, Robert. Good to see you. Um, just but before, before we admit Robert and Myrna, let me just tell you a little bit about membership at New Life. It, this is uh, it, it's a pretty simple process. It requires two things. A credible profession of faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior and baptism. Uh, Robert and Myrna have already been baptized uh, and they have made a credible profession of faith in, in Jesus. We, we schedule an interview with a couple of our elders and, uh, and, and they have uh, t told them their story. And so now I ask them nine questions. And these nine questions do two things. They flesh out a credible profession of faith. So by answering these questions, Robert and Myrna will again be making publicly their uh, profession of faith in Christ. And then they also flesh out the scriptural duties and responsibilities of men and women who uh, are members of Christ's church. And they are, will be, by answering these questions in the affirmative, they'll be agreeing to, uh, to abide by what the scripture says we are to do uh, as, as people in Christ's church. Okay? So Robert and Myrna, nine questions here. Do you believe that the Bible is God's word and that in it he's told us the only way we can enjoy his favor and be with him in heaven? Do you believe that you have sinned by disobeying God's commands in what you think, say, and do? Do you believe that you cannot save yourself from God's judgment against your sin merely by trying to do good or be good? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who became man for our salvation? Amen. Do you believe that Jesus lived the obedient life that you should have lived, that he died on the cross to suffer the punishment that your sin deserves, and that he rose from the dead? Do you trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, believing that only through him can your sins be forgiven and can you enjoy eternal life with God? Amen. In gratitude for God's grace and in reliance on the Holy Spirit, will you try to please and honor your Lord and Savior by loving him and serving him and other people as he instructs us in the scriptures? Do you promise to worship regularly with the other members of this church, to love and pray for them, to serve them with the abilities that the Lord gives you, and to make offerings to support the church's mission and ministries? Great. And finally, do you promise to respect the elders, to submit to them as they care for you according to God's word, to pray for them, and to do what you can to promote the purity and the unity of Christ's church? Amen. Okay, Robert and Myrna have answered those questions in the affirmative. If you're a member of New Life Presbyterian Church, and would you please repeat after me, we welcome you in the name of Jesus. We welcome you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for bringing Robert and Myrna to us. Uh, it is a blessing to watch our family grow uh, as you bring people to us, and uh, even as they come, Lord, we know that they come from your hand, and they, Robert and Myrna come with, with their own g gifts and, and abilities that we need, uh, and so I pray, Lord, that you would begin to open up doors of opportunity for them to serve and to minister to us here uh, with their unique giftings, even as we welcome them and minister to them. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. We're, the elders are going to welcome you, but I got to do the baptism first. So if you want to, why don't you just grab a seat here in the front row, and then we'll we'll do the baptism, and we'll we'll then greet you right right after that. Uh, Brendan and Catherine, I'm going to ask you you can you can stay there for a moment while I do the uh, um, the little explanation. Um, baptism. Uh, we're going to be baptizing Camille Bailey Bonds today, and. Um, uh, Brendan and Catherine are in our life group. Um, and 
Jamie is my little buddy from our life group, her big brother, and uh, it's, it's a great pleasure. But why, we, why do we do this? Some of you wonder, and I thought, I, you know, I'd take a moment to ex- sort of explain why do we baptize infants? People, uh, you know, there are Christians from other traditions who don't do that. Why do, why do we do it? Um, well, let me, let me just briefly explain. Uh, you know, in the Old Testament, the, the promises were given, of, of, uh, the Old Covenant promises were given to their adult, to the adults and their children. And those promises were signified and sealed by a sacrament. The sacrament was, in the Old Testament, was circumcision, right? Obviously only applied to boys, but, and that was applied to boys at eight days old, right? So they didn't, uh, you know, they didn't know those boys, they didn't know the faith. They, they weren't professing faith at eight days old. They didn't understand anything except this hurts. Um, and uh, so it's difficult to imagine, right, that a more, the more expansive new covenant, right, the, the greater grace uh, that is offered in the new covenant through Jesus should not also be given to and signified and sealed to the children of Christian parents. And actually, we don't have to imagine that because that's what Peter said in his very first sermon uh, in the book of Acts. Peter said, for the promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, for everyone whom the Lord our God God calls to himself. Second, we didn't make up, the Presbyterians didn't make up this connection between between circumcision and baptism. Paul actually talks about it in, in Colossians 2, 8 through 15. And in the Old Testament, people were saved by faith in Jesus, uh, or saved by faith in the Lord, but the administration of the sign and seal of circumcision wasn't tied to the timing of their faith, right? They're, they're circumcised at eight days old. Their faith comes later. Uh, so uh, it's the same with baptism. The administration of baptism, just like circumcision, is, does not have to be tied to the moment of profession. Uh, we, we, put, we signify the, the blessings and, the, and we seal them to them now, uh, but the, the, the profession of faith comes later. Third and finally, uh, we, we baptize the, the, the children of Christian parents because the Bible says the children of a Christian parent are holy. Now, some of you Christian parents are scratching your heads going, what? Right? Not mine. Not, not if you mean, if, if, not if holy means super spiritual and sinless. No, but no, it's not holy in, that, in the sense of being super spiritual or sinless. Um, uh, the, it's holy in the sense of being set apart. Our children are set apart. Uh, if you're a Christian parent, your children are set apart to and for God. Circumcision visibly set apart uh, the children of believers in the Old Testament and, so, and in the New Testament. Uh, what set our children apart is the new covenant sign and seal of baptism. And, and I love baptism, baptizing babies because it is a beautiful picture of grace, isn't it? Right? We, are, we are signifying and sealing benefits to these kids and they haven't done anything. They don't understand them. They haven't done anything to deserve them. It's all coming to them by grace, which is exactly the way Jesus comes to us and the blessings of salvation uh, come to us. Um, what, what better picture of undeserving grace uh, than baptizing a little child? Um, but understand, right? Like circumcision, baptism without faith ultimately does, doesn't avail anything. What baptism does right now is mark out this child. Camille is going to be marked out today as a member of Christ's visible church. She's a member of it. She's going to be a non-communing member, right? Meaning she's a member. She's entitled to all the benefits and privileges of being a member at New Life except coming to communion right? And that we hold off until little Camille grows up and, and professes the faith herself. Um, so th- in the Baptist tradition, right, when people profess faith, they're baptized. In our tradition, baptism, like circumcision, comes first. When, they, when the kids profess faith, then they come to the table. That's the visible marker because, because participating in the table requires knowing, understanding, just like 
participation in Passover did uh, for, for Jewish children. So, uh, we're gonna, and in a moment, friends, you're going to be taking a vow. You're part of this. You're going to be taking a vow to help uh, Brendan and Catherine as, as Camille's parents to raise her and to nurture her uh, in the Lord. What does that mean uh, when you take that vow? That means minimally that you're going to pray for them. Every, uh, we can all do that. Uh, it also means encourage them. Uh, it means uh, babysit for them. It means work in the nursery and change Camille's diaper. Um, it, it means uh, teach Camille Sunday school class. Um, so, right, there are a lot of things we can do. Uh, and it's just what, what a, it's another wonderful privilege of being in a church like this is that we can come around and help these young parents uh, nurture their children. So, all right. Uh, would you come on up, Brendan and Catherine, and uh, bring little Camille Bailey? Is Jamie going to come too? All right. Jamie, my buddy. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, before we baptize Camille, Brendan, and Catherine, I have a f- couple of questions for you. Um, anybody, you got family here? Yep. Amen. Excellent. Oh, yeah, I see. There you go. You can, you can be standing. You can come on up if you want. It's, uh, no, we're g- glad, to have, glad to have everybody here. Um, okay, Brendan and Catherine, do you accept the fact that this beautiful child, Camille, uh, is guilty of Adam's sin? just like we all are when we're born, and needs to be saved by God's grace alone through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Do you believe that God brought Camille into his family, the church, as as his covenant child? Yes. She's a doll, look at that. So so serene. Uh, Do you promise to rely on God's grace to live the kind of Christian life that Camille can imitate? Yes. Amen. Will you pray with Camille and teach her the Bible so that she will grow to love God and others? And finally, will you discipline Camille to turn her away from sin? And will you use every opportunity to help her grow into her Christian faith? Amen. All right. And now to the congregation. You members of New Life, do you undertake the responsibility of assisting Brendan and Catherine in the Christian nurture of little Camille? If you do, would you please raise your right hand? Wonderful. Thank you. That's a blessing, right? Huge blessing. Camille Bailey Bonds is two months old, and she's looking at me so innocently. Can I hold her? Yeah. There we Hi, sweetie. Are so pretty, and that's a beautiful baptism gown. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Jamie. Your little sister's gonna get her head wet in a second here. <laughs> all right, now stand up here so you can all see. Hi, Camille. Camille Bailey Bonds is two months old. Camille Bailey Bonds. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What a sweetheart. I'll let you hold her. Wow. And this, let me pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for, God, the blessing of children on this beautiful little girl. Thank you for Jamie, her older brother, and for her parents. Lord, help us to raise them, uh, to, to, to help them parent their children in the, as, as they grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this great blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Robert and Myrna, you want to come up here and stand? And uh, we will congratulate parents, grandparents, if you want to come up and take pictures. That's, uh, that's good. We're, we're good. Thank you, guys. Oh, while, while the elders are greeting, you can stand, stretch your legs, greet one another, and we're going to return and, just, and pray in just a moment. Thanks.
Let us pray. The portion of adoration in today's prayer comes from Augustine's Confessions. Let us pray. O oh God, most high, excellent, most powerful, omnipotent, supremely merciful and supremely just, most hidden yet intimately present, infinitely beautiful and infinitely strong, steadfast yet elusive, Unchanging yourself, though you control the change in all things, never new, never old, renewing all things, you alone are the Lord. You owe us nothing, yet you pay your debts. You write off our debts to you, yet you lose nothing thereby. You, the one who knows all things, know us and love us. When we consider your holiness and perfection, we are struck by our own sin. Your law is holy and good, yet we fail to keep it. We idolize the created instead of worshiping their creator. We are consumed by the sinful desires of our flesh. Some of us are quick to anger, others quick to gossip. We dishonor you with our lying tongues. Selfishness fills our sinful hearts. Too often we fail to love our neighbor or love you as we should. We sin against you in thought, word, and deed. Have mercy on us, miserable offenders, Lord. As we are reminded of our sin, we recognize that no one is righteous, not one. No one seeks for you. All of us have turned away. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, unable to come to you, deserving of your wrath, but you made a way that we could be right before you. In this Advent season, we remember and thank you that your son took on flesh, was born of a virgin, and dwelt among men. You sent your son, your only son, to die on the cross for our sin. He took the punishment he didn't deserve so that we could have life with you that we could never earn. We thank you, Lord, for this work. We thank you that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Though we are sinful people deserving of wrath, we know that there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. It is because of Christ's work for us that we can approach your throne boldly in prayer. Thank you that your Holy Spirit intercedes for us and that you hear our prayers. We pray for your church, both local and around the world, be glorified this morning as your people come together to praise you. We know that your church is under much suffering around the world. For our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted in your name, encourage and strengthen them. Remind them that their help comes from the Lord. For those suffering in our church from various ailments, afflictions, they've lost loved ones, comfort and heal them. We pray for the Afghan refugee families that we as a church are supporting, those coming to San Diego. We pray that they would be blessed and that the love you have for them would shine through new life. May you use these small gifts as seeds through which the gospel is planted in their hearts. Cause us to love our neighbor like you love us. Speak through Pastor Ted, we pray. Use him as an instrument for your purposes. For the unbeliever, the one who rejects, the one who is unsure, soften their hearts. Prepare us to hear your word. We pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, at this time, you'll please reach down and grab the friendship binder, fill in information and pass it down the road. And when it reaches the end, please return it, return it back. And as the binders are going around, parents with young children, we'd like to give you this time to excuse your children, if you would like, for our nursery, toddlers, and children's church programs. As Christians, we celebrate Christmas. It is a wonderful time for us. It's a reminder of, for all of us that Jesus Christ, our Savior, was born. But it's so much more than that, isn't it? It's not that just Jesus was born, but it's that him coming was and still is the ultimate sign or our God's faithfulness towards us. 
Our brother Quinn just prayed, our Christ died while we're still sinners. Well, you go more than that. Christ came while we're still sinners. And that promise was given to us, not in, not in the prophets, but much more bit before that. We go all the way to Genesis. There is that promise that the Son is coming. And so as we are reminded during this Advent season of our God's faithfulness, I hope that as we sing our next song, King of Kings, there's a wonderful reminder of history of all that Christ did for us, of him also returning for us. May that be in our hearts as we prepare ourselves for God's word as we sing the song, King of Kings. worship team. Before we get into the word, just a couple of reminders. We're still collecting uh, the uh, 
various things that are going to go into those Afghan uh, refugee welcome baskets. You can drop them by uh, the office. There are some collection baskets in the foyer there. Um, and if you still, ha it's not too late to uh, bring something. You can grab an ornament off the tree um, and bring it on Wednesday night. That's your ticket in if you'd like. Uh, and Wednesday night, again, is our night of celebration uh, when uh, we will come together, sing some songs, um, uh, you know, bless those boxes as they go out to to our new neighbors, our, these Afghan refugees, and we watch uh, uh, Paul, Paul Maley's uh, one-man production of A Christmas Carol. Um, and I hope you've been thinking about and inviting uh, uh, people, um, praying for those that you want to invite. I'd love to see this be a uh, just a wonderful outreach event. Not you know not just something we're doing for for our own enjoyment, but but reaching out to the community with uh, with the message of Christmas. So that's Wednesday night, six thirty. Look forward to seeing you there. Okay, um, now we turn to God's word. Last Sunday, uh, we looked at Matthew's gospel, and we looked at the genealogy that's that. Uh, uh, in which he began his gospel, which uh, told us about the roots of Christmas. And today we're going to now be in Luke's gospel, and we're going to look at the Annunciation event, uh, that moment when the angel Gabriel announces to the Virgin Mary what is about to happen to her. And in Mary, we're going to see the faith of Christmas. That's the theme this morning. So if... Uh, you would please open your Bibles uh, or your bulletins, and if you are able, I could ask you to stand one more time for the reading of God's Word. The text is Luke chapter 1, uh, verses 26 to 38. This is God's Word. In the sixth month, and let me stop there, uh, sixth month of what? This is the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Right, Elizabeth is, the, is the, the barren woman, the wife of Zechariah the priest, who uh, was mirac miraculously conceives, uh, conceived uh, a baby who was going to be John the Baptist. So it's the sixth month of her pregnancy. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a vir virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the Son of the Most High and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is God's word. You may be seated. Let's pray. Father, as we look at a very real and natural Mary in a very real and supernatural moment, show us what you would have us learn and apply in our lives for our good and for your glory. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, you know, because of art and Christmas cards and stained glass, uh, 
the Virgin Mary has become for me, and I suspect most of us, kind of a frozen, two-dimensional, haloed, right, sentimentalized, kind of unreal figure. Uh, but Mary is very real, right? A real young woman in real life facing real challenges. Uh, and that becomes clear in the biblical account of Christmas, both Matthew's and Luke's, right? The biblical record of the first Christmas is not some sentimental journey, uh, you know, away from reality and into a, a Thomas Kincaid painting. It, it, it's a deep dive, the first Christmas is. It's a deep dive into reality, into life in all of its messiness, you know, all of its suffering, all of its mystery, all of its risk. And Mary was right there. You know, she gets this announcement from Gabriel that she's going to conceive and bear a son. And, and she's not even going to have the right to name her own son. Uh, a, a prerogative of parents and an important prerogative for Hebrew parents. Uh, but that prerogative was taken from her. Uh, this in some ways was not her son, right? In many ways it was. But this is... This is this is a special person, and she's instructed to give him a special name, Jesus, uh, in Hebrew, Yeshua. And, and that's a compound name that literally means Yahweh saves. Yahweh, the, the personal name uh, of God. Yahweh saves, that's his name. So in, in his name alone, right, this God-given name, we're, get a, we're given a hint before he's born uh, of his mission. His mission is to save people. And we see from the other descriptors that, that Gabriel used, uh, like great, son of the most high, uh, the one who sits on David's throne forever, the king whose reign will never come to an end. We see from those descriptors that this savior... Uh, is going to be divine. I mean, those are divine titles. Uh, it's just, he's describing an unmistakably divine person, which is, you know, we ought to just stop right there and, and, and say, you know, this is a great reminder of where our functional, everyday trust needs to be. Um, C.S. Lewis talked about uh, the sweet poison of false infinites, the sweet poison of false infinites, uh, right? The United States is not going to last forever. Uh, your money is not going to last forever. Your career will not last forever. Your family and friends will not last forever. Your health won't last forever. Your beauty will not last forever. Every one of those things is a false infinite, And it's so easy to anchor our lives on one or more of those things or maybe something else. It's, as Lewis said, it's sweet poison. It's easy to go to and it goes down easily. Uh, but this is a reminder, right, in Gabriel's description of this one to be born to, to the Virgin Mary that only Jesus is forever. That, that, that this... Uh, this king uh, is going to have a kingdom which will be standing when nothing else is standing. So where does it make sense for you and for me to put our functional trust? Right? Jesus is not just a holy man. He's the holy God. He has a fully human nature uh, from his mother uh, and a fully divine nature from the Holy Spirit who in a way we don't fully understand conceived the already existing Jesus and implanted him into the womb of Mary. Right? That's why we confess in the Apostles' Creed and have for centuries, right? Right? Uh, he was, speaking of Jesus, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He's the one to trust. 
right? He's, he's the one who will last. He's the one who will be there always. He's the one who will not let you down because he will be there. He's the only Savior. And you know, being the only Savior, that means that every God believer before Mary was saved by Jesus, right? All, every Old Testament God follower was saved by Jesus even though he had not been born yet, even though their knowledge of him was limited, their knowledge of him is not what our knowledge is, uh, they were trusting in a Messiah to come, a, a God-promised Messiah. They were waiting for him. They knew he was going to come. That's where they were believing. That's where they were trusting. And they were really trusting in Jesus. So in that sense, Mary falls into a long line of, of Jesus' believers. Uh, but in another way, you know, you could say when you think about it that, that Mary was the first Christian. And because through her, right, this long-awaited Messiah that every believer before her was trusting in, he has, through her, he finally comes. And so she was the first person in history as his birth mother to receive and accept and trust in Jesus by name and on his terms. And so since Mary is in that way the first Christian, she is for us a kind of paradigm believer. How God interacts with her and, and how she responds to God is instructive for you and for me. Obviously, I mean, she's, she's in a unique situation. I mean, what happened to Mary is not going to happen to us. But nevertheless, in, in, in the way God interacts with her, the way she interacts with God, we see kind of the protocol, the pattern for, uh, for, for Jesus' followers. So what do we learn from her? What do you learn from her? Uh, five things. This is a five-point sermon, but I'm going to be whipping through these, so hang on. Um, first thing, number one. Uh, first thing we learn, to quote uh, uh, Dorothy Sayers, no one is too unimportant to be the Lord's friend. You know, get it out of your head if it's there that, that there was something in Mary that qualified her for this remarkable divine assignment. It, it's not there. Uh, Mary was, was not super qualified spiritually. She was not super qualified spiritually. Right? She was, she had none of the markers that would, you'd think would, you know, mark her out as somebody to be chosen for this incredible task. Right? She wasn't wealthy. In fact, we know she was among the poor. She was not well known. She was anonymous. Uh, she came from a nowhere town. Uh, in fact, Nazareth was so nowhere <laughs> that it, it is, uh, it's remarkable in that it is one of the important geographical places in the New Testament that is never mentioned in the Old Testament. Nazareth is not mentioned once uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, she grew up and lived far away from the halls of power and influence like Jerusalem uh, or Rome. She was a, f a female in a male-dominated society. She was likely a young woman. She was likely illiterate. Um, and I think most importantly, uh, she was no less sinful than you or me. She didn't have a halo. Right? Forget the Christmas cards. Right? No gold halo. Um, she needed the grace of God every bit as much as you and I do. Uh, and then that's why, you know, it's, you know you, did you pick up the tone of, of Gabriel's, you know, uh, interaction with her? It's all about grace, right? Uh, Mary, I mean, uh, you have found favor. The word is grace. You've found grace with God. 
You, are, you have had grace bestowed upon you. He doesn't show up and say, Mary, you know, we've been looking around the world and man, we have seen, we have seen how spiritual you are, how religious you are, how, you know, how sin-free you are. No, and, and now we're going to reward you uh, by giving you this incredible honor. That's not what he says, right? He shows up and says, Mary... You found grace. You have found the unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor of God. There's nothing you did to deserve this. There's no one too unimportant to be the Lord's friend. It could be you. It could be me. Second thing we learn. uh, The divine human relationship always starts like a game of hide and seek. And Jesus is it. He's the seeker. And we are the hiders. Mary wasn't looking for God here. But God was looking for her. And whom God looks for, God finds. Mary was not looking for favor grace Uh, but she found it anyway because Jesus found her verse 30 right do not be afraid Mary for you have found favor with God you can almost hear her thinking I wasn't looking but she found it she found grace with God and I guess a good question that this this raises for us uh, you know, at this time of year is, are you still hiding from God? Trying to hide from God. Um, it's what we do. It's what our sin causes us to do. Uh, you go back to the original creation account, right? What, what was one of the first effects of sin? Hiding, right? Covering oneself, jumping in the bushes, <laughs> hiding uh, from God. It's what our sin causes us to do. Some people try to hide from God by, by pushing him away, right? Rejecting religion, uh, ridiculing religion, ignoring religion uh, in an attempt to, uh, to, to make God uh, irrelevant, uh, to hide from him. Um, uh, others are more sophisticated. They actually try to hide from God by using religion. Flannery uh, O'Connor, the great Roman Catholic Southern writer, she recognized that strategy uh, when she described a character in her first novel like this. Quote, there was already a deep black wordless conviction in him that the way to avoid Jesus was to avoid sin. (laughs) In a lot of people trying to avoid Jesus by being moral, by being good, I mean, how many people do you know? Maybe you say it. I'm good enough. And I don't need, I don't need a savior. You know? And you're working hard uh, to convince yourself, to convince others, to convince God if he's there uh, that you're good enough. You can't do it. You can't hide from God through your irreligion or your religion. God is the seeker. He will find you out. First thing, third thing we learn is that being found by Jesus means new creation. Being found by Jesus entails new creation. This is it, right? And you can see that super clearly with Mary, right? She, she's, she, her faith is seeking understanding here, Right? Unlike Zechariah, who asked a question that was really a, really a statement of unbelief, uh, Mary, Mary's faith is seeking understanding. And so she's, she's asking a question. She's, you know, how is this going to happen? How's it going to happen? Because I, I haven't known a man. I'm a, I'm a virgin. And Gabriel says in verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Uh, that language that Gabriel uses there to describe this mysterious process that we don't understand, um, it, th- that language e- evokes the image of the Holy Spirit at creation. Right? If 
Go back to Genesis 1. And very quickly in the, in the Genesis 1 creation account, we're introduced to the Holy Spirit. And what's he doing? He's overshadowing the darkness. He's overshadowing the chaos. Uh, and, and, and then out of that, the Holy Spirit is, is bringing order and he's bringing life, right? He's like only God can bring life out of non-life. And so, so Gabriel sort of uses that image to say that, Mary, that is in effect what is going to happen. The Holy Spirit is going to hover over you like he hovered over, uh, o- o- over an empty world. He's going to hover over you. He's going to hover over your empty, dark womb, and he's going to plant in their life. Right, the already existing but new to her life of Jesus. And you know, the same sort of thing happens, similar thing, happens to you, has happened to you if you're a Christian. Right? It's when Jesus finds you, what 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 happens, right? The the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and what does Jesus say? You are born again. Remember, that's, that, that, he used that phrase in that conversation with Nicodemus, the Pharisee, um, who had de- dedicated his entire life to the pursuit uh, of the Lord of the Bible. And, 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 and Jesus says, it, all of that is really for nothing. Because what you need is, a, you need to start over. You need a redo Everybody does. You need to be born again. It mystified Nicodemus. But, the, but you know, the, there it is. We, it, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Do you know that, Christian? You are a new creation. Behold, the, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. I mean, we all sense at some point in our lives, right, we need a fresh start. And, and Jesus, being found by Jesus, is the ultimate fresh start. Being born again is the ultimate fresh start, right? You're, you become a brand new person as, as the Holy Spirit comes upon you. This is, I mean, something, right, it, we don't fully perceive all of this happening, but you have to understand that is what's happening. This is, it's not just some uh, transaction where you intellectually assent to, to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God and he, uh, uh, that He is your Lord and Savior. Um, no, even before you can have faith, even before you can put on your lips that Jesus Christ is Lord and has risen from the dead, you have, there, there, something has spiritually happened to you. You have been spiritually reborn. You, you are a dwelling place for Jesus differently, but just as literally as Mary became a dwelling place for Jesus. Right? She was literally the dwelling place for the pre-born uh, Jesus. Coming you know, coming to faith, being found by Jesus Christ entails new creation. Some of you um, have read the book Unbroken, and, and if you haven't, read it. Um, and it's, uh, the, it, the movie's good, but not as good as the book, never is. It's about Louis Zamperini, um, Olympic athlete who, who uh, went into World War II and endured years of torture, just unspeakable torture and trauma in, in the Pacific theater of World War II, um, years in a Japanese concentration camp. And when he was finally liberated and at the end of the war, and he came back a war hero, but he came back eaten alive by, and being eaten alive by hatred by this um, all-consuming desire for revenge, by violent fantasies, by, by horrific nightmares, all of which he tried to numb 
with alcohol, which led him to abusing his wife and neglecting his daughter. And, and ultimately, uh, Jesus found this messed up shell of a man at a Billy Graham event, and, um, and he was born again. Right, and and the and this is where the movie does. You don't see this in the movie as nearly as well as in the book, but the nightmares stop, and and this all-consuming desire for revenge, and 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 hatred, was replaced by love. And and we know that. I mean, it really became clear when four years after his conversion in the late 1940s, um, he returned to Japan. He flew to Japan and actually went to a prison and met with his torturers face to face. The very soldiers who, who had tortured him for years. And he, and, he exca- and he expressed his love for them. He expressed Jesus' love for them. He f- forgave them. Uh, and he preached the gospel to them. And many of those soldiers came to faith in Jesus Christ because of his testimony. Who does that? Not the old Louis Zamperini. Not in a million years. But the new Zamperini, the reborn Louis Zamperini, he did it. Did it four years later. You see. He was a new creation, and so are you. Fourth thing we learn. Finding favor with God does not mean finding favorable life circumstances. And man, this this one is so important. One, because it's so hard to get into our heads. In part because we're Americans, in part because of the pernicious evil of the prosperity gospel which says that you know God is wants you to be happy and fulfilled and healthy and have suffering as far away from you as possible right now it it just it just it's so in, that is so inconsistent with what the bible says the biblical record and I am, I've been, especially in the last 18 months or so, been feeling the weight of your life stories. Really have. And, you know, we have husbands and wives here dying of various diseases. We have irreconcilable differences multiplying between members of families and between friends. We have... Some of you have adult children who um, were baptized here just like we saw today and have made a choice to walk away from faith in Jesus. We have people making sinful choices. Some of you have children making sinful choices that are hard to recover from, humanly impossible to recover from. There will be, if, if there is a turning, there, there will be scars and you just don't see how it will ever happen. Uh, we have people losing their jobs because of their religious convictions. We have people losing their jobs because of impersonal forces like uh, the, 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 uh, the, you know, the market, the supply chain, the weather. At least 80 people are dead in the South today, two weeks before Christmas. We have people suffering loss of income, and because of that, their homes and their lives that they've built are being threatened. We have people who want to be married and aren't. We have people who are married who don't want to be. We have people who want to have children who can't. Gabriel breaks in. A a, a messenger from God breaks into Mary's life. She wasn't looking for him. He he breaks into her home and, and announces what sounds to me like good news. But she doesn't act like it's good news, right? She's troubled. She's afraid. Why? Well, because in many ways, this good news, and it is good news, was not good news to her. 
It meant immense suffering for her. It meant hardship for her. Right? You think about the moment. I mean, she, it, 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 she was all, you know, she's, she, she's engaged to Joseph. Right? She's now being told she's going she's gonna to be pregnant by, by the Lord. She's, she's got to be convinced that this is probably going to end my engagement with Joseph. And if Joseph had had his way, it would have. So she's already thinking, okay, I'm going to lose Joseph here. And, and I'm going I'm to be bearing a child out of wedlock, which will make me a social pariah in my community. And it will make me unmarriable to anybody else, right? I mean, think about the cost here. And this is all, you, do, you just know, it's just spinning through her head as she's thinking through. And it says she's, she was deeply thinking through, what does this greeting mean? And she knew what it meant for her, and it meant suffering. It meant getting pregnant, which was, you know, in that day, almost a death sentence. You know, even with all our wonderful medical technology, pregnancy and deli delivery is, is, is labor and delivery is a dangerous thing. And back then, it was a deadly thing. And, and women frequently died of childbirth. To, to be, you, you imagine, to, to be to have this honor to, to be carrying this special child and yet knowing that, it, it, you know, the odds are this is my death sentence. And there were this, of course, overwhelming unknowns, which are also huge stressors, right? I'm the, I, am the, I am the king of, you know, worrying about the unknowns. I can make the unknowns very known even though most of the unknowns never happen. But she's got to be thinking, right? How do you parent God? What does that mean? What am I going to do? How do I do that? Um, she has to be thinking, you know, not just in general about how the community reacts. She knows how her community is going to react. What about her parents? You know, we know nothing about her parents. We know nothing about Jesus' grandparents. Um, how would her family react? N presumably not well. Um, what would she do for money if she lost Joseph? Which was likely, right? And she, there was so much she, she didn't even know yet, right? She didn't know that this mission to save people would involve her son's death. She'd learned that. She would learn that his mission was to, was to come and live a holy life for you, the life we don't live, and to then die to satisfy God's judgment against your sin. He becomes your penalty payer. Um, so she would see her son executed on a Roman cross. I can't imagine what that must have been like as a parent. Listen, friends, we just got through 1 Peter, right? And, and, and I chose 1 Peter for a reason, right? Because the theme of 1 Peter is suffering. And if we learned one thing from 1 Peter, we learned that suffering is a normal, expected, and unavoidable part of the Christian life. Trusting your life to Jesus is more like a visit to the draft board than it is to a peaceful retreat center. In a world that is characterized by its rejection of the God of the Bible, its rebellion against the God of the Bible, if you stand with the God of the Bible, if you, if you take on the name of Jesus, if you follow Jesus who suffered, you will suffer in this world. And the call on Mary was a call to suffer. That's why she was troubled and afraid. So how do you deal with it? Well, that gets us to the fifth and final point and the title of the sermon, The Faith of Christmas. Right? 
You deal with it by faith. God initiates, you respond, and your required response is faith. It's trust in the God who initiates a relationship with you. Mary didn't, was afraid, but she didn't surrender to her fear. What she surrendered to was God. Right? Verse 38, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. That, my friends, is trusting surrender, which is just another way of saying that's faith. You see, she sees herself before God rightly. She's the servant. He's the master. She serves him, not the other way around. And then she takes all her fears. She takes all the unknowns. And she still says, yes. She says, yes to God. She trusts. She trusts that God is somehow going to accomplish what he promised. And, and what he's promising here isn't just a baby, right? It's much bigger than that. And, and, you, and you, as you can tell from, from what Gabriel, all that Gabriel says here, what, what, what Gabriel is promising to accomplish here on, uh, with Mary is what God is still promising to us today. And what Jesus tells us to pray for every day. And that, that, that God's will finally, finally establish his kingdom on earth. A kingdom that will last forever. A kingdom that will have one king. Right? No succession plans. One king, because this king lives forever. The king is Jesus Christ. And in that messianic kingdom uh, that is to come, still for us to come. It was for Mary to come. Uh, we're promised that Jesus will wipe away every tear from our eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things will have passed away. Revelation 21.4 See, and we can respond with that kind of surrendering trust rather than fear. We can, we can go to faith rather than fear like Mary did because as Gabriel encouraged Mary at verse 37, nothing will be impossible with God. He had just made an old barren Elizabeth able to conceive and bear a son by her husband, Zechariah. Uh, if he could do that, he can cause a virgin uh, to become pregnant. If he can do that, he can deal with the impossibility that you're dealing with right now. Nothing will be impossible with God. I know, I sit with you, and I... And, and, and we're all just sort of overcome by the human impossibility of some of the situations you're in. Mary's faith reminds us that nothing is impossible with God. Right. And we can respond with faith rather than fear, not only because of that truth, that, that there isn't anything too hard for the Lord, but also because... Jesus came and entered our suffering, right? He entered our fears. He entered our unknowns. He even went ahead of us and entered our death, right? And came out the other side in victory. So just as Jesus' sufferings weren't in vain, and just as Jesus' sufferings had a transcendent redemptive purpose, right? To, to save a people, of which you are a part, to bring about a kingdom which is still coming, assuring your future with God, just as his suffering was, it was not in vain and had that redemptive purpose, so your suffering is also not without purpose. 
The suffering God Jesus walks with you in your suffering with impossibility beating power with whatever you're going through and he is using your suffering for his redemptive purposes. He's using it, big picture, to bring about his kingdom. Viktor Frankl, brilliant man, survivor of the Holocaust, was once asked, based on his experience in, in, in a German concentration camp, you know, how, how, how do you not give in to despair in the face of overwhelming suffering? Speaking of the overwhelming suffering that he was experiencing and watching in this concentration camp. And his answer, interestingly, was a mathematical equation. D equals S minus M, Frankel said. And then he translated. He says, despair equals suffering minus meaning. Right. In other words, what brings about despair is meaningless suffering. But Christians, there is for you no such thing. None of your suffering is minus meaning. You may not know the meaning. You may not know the sp specific meaning, the specific purposes of your specific suffering. I may not know it. I almost certainly don't know it as your pastor, but I'll sit next to you. I'll stand next to you as you go through it and, and pray with you and be with you. But more importantly, Jesus is with you through it. And you know that whatever the suffering is you're going through, it comes to you through the hand of a good and sovereign God who loves you and suffered for you. Right? He's not aloof. He's alive. And, and he, has, he has experienced what you're experiencing. He knows it. He loves you. And he's using your suffering for your good and his glory. And his glory will always be uh, to your good. As Paul exalted once, right? Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what we are walking around with, new creations. We are walking around with Christ in us, the hope of glory. All right? Hang on to that. Like Mary, your life is suffering now. And it's glory later. And we know that because of what Jesus accomplished, that glory is going to happen. It is coming. Amen. Let's pray. Father, uh, we thank you uh, for your coming to us in the person of Jesus. Thank you. What we learn from your birth mother. Thank you for what um, the human nature that you share uh, with us because you were born of that Virgin Mary um, which makes you approachable um, and which makes you as God able to um, die for our sins able to suffer so that you become our sympathetic priest thank you that that's who you are and so, Lord, I pray for my, my brothers and sisters here, many of whom are going through deep, deep waters right now. Lord, would you encourage them? Give them faith like Mary's. Help us not to surrender to our fear, um, but to surrender to you in faith. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to collect the offering now as our final act of worship. If you're a guest today, you don't have an obligation to give. We're happy you're here. Um, but giving is, is worship as we, we share back uh, with, uh, to the Lord some of what he's blessed us with so that his kingdom 
can grow and move forward. So let's worship the Lord with our giving now as we sing our final song of praise together. please stand for God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.